Hello and welcome. This is Anne Margaret with Emotions to Evolve. I really enjoy coming across new creation stories that I have yet to have read. And this is one in particular that I wanted to share. It is actually in regards to the Dogon people of Mali. So I will be reading an excerpt from a book titled The Science of the Dogon. And my personal interest in the Dogon is because I have inherited a Touareg cross from the Dogon tribe. And my understanding is that it resembles the north, south, east, and west, but everlasting life, which will be in another uh, posting here on YouTube. But this book in particular has a succinct way of how the Dogon's creation story is described, how the one true God, Ama, created all the matter of the universe. And as I read, interestingly, the myths that depict his creative efforts bear a striking resemblance to the modern scientific definitions of matter beginning with the atom and continuing all the way to the vibrating threads of string theory. Furthermore, many of the Dogon words, symbols, and rituals used to describe the structure of matter are quite similar to those found in the myths of ancient Egypt and in the daily rituals of Judaism. For example, the modern scientific depiction of the unformed universe as a black hole is identical to Amma's egg of the Dogon and the Egyptian Benben stone. Those are both worthy to look up on other channels. Uh, I may have something posted here soon about it, but as for right now, I will read the Dogon creation story. The Dogon say that the stars were created from pellets of earth, flung out into space by the one true God, Amma. The sun and the moon were created by a process much like that of making pottery, which was the first known invention of God. The sun is like a pot that has been fired until it is white hot, then surrounded by a spiral of copper with eight turns. To create the earth, Amma squeezed a lump of clay in his hand, and threw it away from himself in the same manner as he did the stars. The clay spread to the north and to the south, the top and the bottom, in a movement that was horizontal. By nature, the earth is female. Looking at it flat and considering the cardinal points of the compass as her appendages, it is like a woman lying on her back with her arms and legs spread. The anthill is her female organ. In the course of time, Amma tried to fertilize her, but in what was a breach of order in the universe, proper intercourse could not take place. In the universe, there is a principle of twin births, but this flawed union between God and earth created only one being, the jackal, which became the symbol of disorder and the difficulties of God. Later, having overcome the difficulty, God had intercourse with the earth again, this time successfully. Water, which is the divine seed, entered the womb of the earth and resulted in the birth of twins. Two beings were formed, which God created like water. They were green in color and were half human, half serpent. Their bodies were green and sleek all over and shiny like the surface of the water. These spirits were called Numo, and they were born perfect. They had eight members, and their number was eight, which is also the symbol of speech. There were a divine essence, which is the life force of the world, and is water. The name Numo is synonymous in the Dogon language with the word of water. To the Dogon, Numo is water, and the Numo pair is present in all water, whether it is drinking water, 
water of the river, or water of storms. The life force of earth is water. God molded the earth with water. Blood too he made out of water. Even in a stone there is this force, for there is moisture in everything. But if pneumo is water, it also produces copper. When the sky is overcast, the sun's rays may seem materializing on the misty horizon. These rays, excreted by the spirits, are of copper and are light. They are water too, because they uphold the earth's moisture as it rises. The pair excrete light because they are also light. After the defilement of the earth during the first ill-fated attempt at intercourse, God decided to create man directly. He formed a womb and a male organ from two lumps of clay. These lumps developed into the first pair of humans, a male and a female. Man, who is usually born one at a time, violated the mythological principle of twin births. So to atone for this, man was given two souls, one male and one female. The first man and woman had intercourse with each other and gave birth in pairs to a series of eight children who became the eight ancestors. The first four were male, the next four female. In the beginning, the eight ancestors did not know death, but lived on indefinitely. By a special dispensation permitted only to them, they were able to fertilize themselves. The Numo twins represent the ideal unit. When the Numo looked down at the earth and saw it unclothed and speechless, they decided to put an end to the disorder and confusion. The Numo came down to earth, bringing with them the fibers of plants created in heaven. From these fibers, they created the first garment, which was made of two strands of ten fibers, one strand worn in front, the other in back. The way the fibers hung in spiraling coils was symbolic of the water of tornadoes and hurricanes. The fibers themselves were reminiscent of the sun, which dries up moisture and were also like the speech of the pneumo, which comes out in a warm vapor of water, the sound of which tapers off in spiraling coils. In this sense, the moisture of the words of the pneumo was transferred to the fibers of the garment. This fiber skirt was called the first word. In the anthill, the male pneumo assumed the role of the masculine element, and the female pneumo took the role of the female element. After a time, instinct led the oldest of the eight ancestors toward the anthill, wearing a wooden bowl on his head to protect him from rain. He put his feet into the opening of the anthill and sank in, all except the bowl, which became caught on the edges of the opening. This freed him from his role as a physical being, and he was taken under the guidance of the pneumo pair. He followed the male pneumo into the depths of the earth, where, in the waters of the earth's womb, he curled up like a fetus, shrank to germinal form, and acquired the quality of water the seed of God, and the essence of the two Nomo spirits. Just as the eight copper spirals give the sun its movement, the spiral of the word gave the womb its regenerative movement. All eight ancestors, one by one, had to be transformed in this way. Now, three is the number of the male element. Four is the number of the female element. The seventh object or event in a series represents completion, even though it is not inherently better than any of the others because it is the sum of the male and female elements. The words that the female pneumo spoke to herself turned into a spiral and entered her into her sexual part, and the male pneumo helped her. These words are what the seventh ancestor learned while inside the womb. 
the seventh ancestor received perfect knowledge of the second word, which was not reserved for particular recipients, but was meant for all mankind. During his transformation, the seventh ancestor developed slowly in the womb of the earth. On the day when his transformation was complete, he emerged at sunrise and using his teeth as a weaver's reeds and the movement of his jaws to create a shuttle action, invented the art of weaving. While weaving, he imparted technical instruction so that people could understand the process, demonstrating by example the need for harmony between spiritual forces and physical actions. The words that the spirit spoke were words woven into the cloth as it was created. They were the cloth, which was the word. The Dogon call woven material soy, which means it is the spoken word. Soy also means seven, after the seventh ancestor. The Numo, acting on behalf of Ama, planned to initiate projects to improve and redeem mankind, but they were concerned about the effect of contact between spiritual beings such as themselves and people of flesh and blood. So after their transformations, the eight ancestors were taken to heaven with the Numo to learn the skills of civilization. Later, each was given one of the eight grains of heaven, and they returned to live with men again, bringing with them their newly learned skills. Until that time, people had lived in holes dug in the soil. Then they noticed the shape of the anthill, which they found to be much better than the earthen holes. They copied its shape and made mud huts, added rooms and passageways, and began to use them to store food. When the first ancestor came down from heaven, he was standing on a square piece of heaven shaped like the first granary. The first granary was shaped like a woven basket turned upside down. It was round at the bottom, square and flat at the top, and wider at the bottom than the top. There were stairways with 10 steps up the middle of each of the four sides, which faced the cardinal points of north, south, east, and west. The door of the granary was on the sixth step to the north side. Inside were two levels containing eight chambers each. Structural features of the granary had symbolic meaning. The round base represented the sun. The square roof represented the sky. A circle in the center of the roof represented the moon. The rise of each step was male. The tread was female. The combined total of 40 steps, eight males and females, represented the 80 offspring of the eight ancestors. Each stairway was associated with a constellation or planet and a group of creatures. The northern stairway was associated with the Pleiades and represented men and fish. The southern one was associated with the belt of Orion and represented domesticated animals. The eastern one was associated with Venus and represented birds. And the western one was associated with what the Dogon called the long-tailed star and represented wild animal, vegetables, and insects. The ten steps up each side of the granary represented different family orders of the animal and plant kingdoms. For the Dogon, there is also symbolism associated with the eight compartments of the granary, four of which were on the lower level and four on the upper. The compartments were separated by two intersecting partitions, which met at a cup-shaped depression in the earth large enough to hold a round jar. The jar, which held grain or objects of value, was the center of the whole building. The compartments were numbered from one to eight, moving counterclockwise around the lower level, starting with the front right compartment, then continuing on to upper level, again starting with the front right compartment. The greenery, like the earth, is earlier descriptions represented a woman 
lying on her back with her arms and legs spread. The jar was her womb. The four uprights were supported corners of the roof where her arms and legs. Her legs were on the north side and the door represented her sexual parts. The woman also represented the sun and her arms and legs were supported. The roof represented the sky. In another way, the greenery also represented the internal organs of the body and showed the circulation of nourishment within a body. Nourishment flowed from the first two compartments, which represented the stomach and gizzard, then moved symbolically into the intestines. Compartment six, and into all of the other compartments as symbolic blood and breath. From there, it moved into the final compartments, which represented the liver and gallbladder. The Dogon consider breath to be vapor, a form of water which is the sustaining principle of life. Assembled on the flat roof of the granary were the tools of a forge, which were to be used by the first ancestor to teach man to make iron tools for cultivating the land. The bellows were made out of the two twin clay pots connected by sheepskin. The shape of the two pots represented the sun. The sheepskin was a symbol of the celestial ram, which was the avatar or animal representation of the male pneumo. The hammer was an iron block with a handle shaped like a cone. The anvil was fixed in a beam of wood. The smith ancestor had an iron bow and spindles for arrows. He shot one arrow into the center of the circle on the roof of the granary, which represented the moon, and he wrapped a long thread around the shank to form a bobbin. He shot a second arrow into the air, which attached to the vault of the sky. The granary represented the new system of the world. It defined a unit of volume. The height of each step was a unit of length, the cubit, The flat square roof was eight cubits long on each side. The square roof and the round base were examples of the two primary geometric figures. Symbolically, the granary represented the shape of an iron shuttle used for ginning cotton. It also represented the head of the hammer, which is male, and the four-sided anvil, which is female. Additionally, It was an image of the webbed hands of the pneumo, of which the hammer was also an image. Finally, it represented the female body, which is the female element of the smith, who, like all beings, was dual in nature. To create the original fire of the smithy, the ancestor stole embers, which were a piece of the sun, from the workshop of the pneumo, who are heaven's smiths. To steal the embers, he used a robber's stick, the crook of which opened in a slit that was like an open mouth. On the way back to the granary smithy, the ancestor accidentally dropped some embers and had to come back to pick them up. He then fled toward the granary, but in the anxiety of his escape, could not locate its entrance. He went around it several times before he found the steps and climbed up to the flat roof, where he hid the embers in the skin of the bellows. He explained guyo, which meant stolen. Today in the Dogon language, guyo means granary. It is a reminder that there would be no grain to store without the fire of the smithy from which iron hose are made. The art of pottery came to be associated with the smithy. The wife of the smith had made a pot, shaped like the clay pots of the bellows, which she was letting dry in the sun. Hoping it would dry more quickly, she moved it closer to the fire of the smithy and found that the heat made the pot harden. From that day on, she was in the habit of firing her pots. Pottery was originally the exclusive domain of the wives of the smiths, but later it became permissible for any woman to practice pottery. 
At this point, the ancestor was ready to begin to work of establishing civilization, starting with the teaching of agriculture. He came down the northern stairway and measured out a square field, eight cubits on each side, oriented to the cardinal points of north, south, east, and west, just like the granary. The field was divided into 80 by 80 units, each one square cubit, which were distributed among the families of the eight ancestors. Mud houses for the families were built along the center line of the land, which ran from north to south. The smithy was established to the north of this line. The Dogon believed that the earth had been pure when it was originally created, but that the jackal's birth made it impure and had disrupted the world order. Agriculture was a symbol of the restoration of order to the pure earth, and wherever agricultural and civilization spread, the impurity of the earth was thought to have receded. According to the Ogok Temmeli, the original method of cultivation was like weaving. It began on the north side and moved from east to west, then back again. Each square in the field contained eight planted rows, eight, each eight feet long in memory of the eight ancestors and the eight seeds. The Dogon say that when a man clears new ground, makes a plot and plants food on the plot, his work is like weaving a cloth. In this way, the skill of agriculture is a form of weaving. Although all eight families were of equal rank, the eighth had a special privilege. Seven is the number of the master of speech, whose job it was to teach speech, but eight is the number of speech itself. Because the oldest living Dogon man belonged to the eighth family, he of all living beings most truly represented the word. His name was Lieb. When the first ancestor, who was a smith, had finished his instruction, the seven other ancestors descended to teach their skill of civilization to man. These skills included leather working, music, and so on and were taught in order of rank. However, the eighth ancestor took his place out of turn and came down before the seventh, who was the master of speech. This made the seventh ancestor so very angry that he turned against the others, took the form of a great serpent, and tried to remove the heavenly grains from the granary. The smith saw the serpent as an adversary and in order to rid himself of it, advised men to kill the snake. Ogak Temeli considered this dispute a turning point in the history of the world. The surface narrative of the Dogon creation story represents themes and incidents that should seem quite familiar to students of ancient mythologies. The sequence and manner in which the godlike entities of the Dogon religion emerge is comparable to that of the earliest Egyptian, Sumerian, and Akkadian religious traditions. The creation story itself includes subplots such as the incident in which the Dogon ancestor steals the fire of the Numo that we find repeated later in the fables of Greek mythology. Likewise, there are many obvious re resemblances between Dogon symbolism and that of Mayan mythology. For example, both cultures conceive of the earth as a woman lying on her back, her arms and legs representing the cardinal compass points. The roughly pyramidal shape and dimensions of the Dogon granary call to mind the early mastabas of ancient Egypt and we find many of the symbolic aspects of the Dogon granary repeated in the flat-topped pyramids of the Americas. The more familiar we become with the deep symbolism of the Dogon creation story, the more we will see that these similarities extend to some of the most remote corners of the world and resonate with the mythologies of societies as diverse as those of the Maori of New Zealand 
earliest cultures of Asia and even the native tribes of North America. So that there is a chapter all titled about the Dogon creation story. And I too am familiar with parts of it, but I had not read it complete entirety because I wanted it to be fresh for all of us. I would love to hear comments on this. It's a fascinating book. Um, be sure that there is more to come. Um, my understanding of the creation, though it's um, mind bending, so to speak, we are all a spark of the divine. Um, Mother Earth seems to be always referred to as female, this planet, and that God, male, is omnipresent, whereas the female can swiftly come in and out as needed. So I, I find that uh, Mother Nature, Mother God, um, Earth, Mother, all female, and yet in primarily most cultures around the globe that God is a male in his uh, omnipresent state and came from clay from Adam and Eve. So there you have it. Until next time, I thank you for listening. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe.